It is five o'clock according to the monitor up here, so we'll get started and begin our worship in just a few moments. We are thankful to see each of you this night. We had a good number also this morning. Some are gluttons. They came back again, and so uh, we're hoping that before long we'll be able to transition back into, after we see sort of how many are in each of the services, to see whether or not we would all fit at one time. Uh, with the pews marked off and other things, so we hopefully we'll be back together if we can still accomplish the distancing and the other things that are necessary for us. Uh, hopefully all of you have your prepackaged uh, communion. All right, uh, we'll get to that in a, in a few moments after our lesson, but uh, we still have those that we want to continue to keep in our prayers. I made mention of this morning of a a young man that we knew from North Alabama, his name is Jeremy Morrow. He's probably somewhere around the boy's age, I guess, maybe a little bit younger, uh, that was involved in an accident. And while they were trying to repair his spleen, uh, he had an uh, aneurysm in his aorta that caused everything to go uh, haywire as far as what they were expecting to do. And so he's still in very serious condition. So we would ask that you keep him in your prayers. Uh, we still have those that we have of our own number and that we still want to keep in our prayers. No doubt, as we see the condition of our country, not only with the coronavirus, but also with the uh, various things going on in the country uh, concerning uh, the death of this man in Minneapolis and then uh, the protests and the riots and other things that are taking place. Uh, let's pray about those things as well. Uh, Brother Jackson Hall is going to be leading us in our singing. Uh, we would ask that uh, those who are going to lead prayers be aware of the fact that uh, there's no germ X up here. So if you come to lead the prayer, we ask that you try not to touch anything as far as up here. And uh, Jackson will be doing the same thing as far as leading from here. So uh, he has given me permission to do his slides, and as I said this morning, uh, I hope I can keep up with where they're supposed to be because a couple of times I almost forgot to advance it, and maybe even one time didn't do it until I realized we were already into the next slide. So uh, it is a great time that we can be together on the Lord's Day to worship. We're thankful that you're here. Pray that it will be beneficial and helpful as we strive to have our spiritual lives uh, energized a little bit as we go through this week. So, Brother Jackson. Good evening. Let's start with I stand amazed. We sing the first, second, and fourth verses. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Yeah. 
Father, we come to you tonight so thankful that we are able to approach you via this avenue of prayer. Father, we acknowledge that you are the true and the awesome God, the creator of all things. Father, that you know all, that you are everywhere, and that you see everything. Father, as we recognize those facts about you, we also recognize that we are weak. Father, that we struggle at times that we are tempted and sometimes we give in to those temptations, that, Father, we often choose to do what we would have to do rather than what you would have us to do. Father, we pray for your forgiveness of anything that may stand between us and thee at this time as we repent of those things, and, Father, as we will strive to do better each and every day. 
Father, as we come before you tonight, we know that so much is going wrong in this country, and we pray for the leaders of the country as they are struggling with these things. Father, that they might guide us in a way that would cause those things to be over as quickly as possible, and that they might always look to you for guidance as they make those important decisions that they have to make. Father, we pray for our local government as well, both at the state level and those communities here about us, the Millbrook community that we are a part of. Pray for those leaders that they might make the right decisions and that they might be comforted, that they might trust in you. Father, we pray for the leadership of this congregation. We know that they have continued to pray and to study and to make the decisions that have had to be made during this difficult time. We are thankful for them and for the decisions that they've made, and we pray that you would give them continued strength and health. Father, that they might be comforted by your word and that we might be a comfort and an encouragement to them as well during this time. Father, we're thankful especially for Brother Terry as he has continued to share your word, to stand in this pulpit week after week, and we are thankful for him, for his love for the truth, Father, help us never to take that for granted, but to always be those who study, who open our Bibles, and who make sure that the things that we're being told are those things that come from your word. Father, as we are here for this period of worship tonight, help us to remember and to realize that we are to be participants, not the audience, that you are the audience. And Father, we pray that you would help us to Recall that, that we might worship from the heart, we might do all things that would be pleasing to you, and that we would worship in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray for all those who cannot be with us here for worship, whether it's those who have continued to need to quarantine themselves or those who are sick and ill, hurting or shut in. Father, we know that so many are sick and hurting at this time, and we pray for them, for their families, for the doctors and nurses that are tending to them. Father, we pray especially for Susie Moore and for her parents as she continues to strive to take care of them as they are both so sick. Father, for all those others that have mentioned, Father, we know that so many are sick and hurting, and we know that your healing hand can fix anything. Father, we pray most of all that your will be done. Father, as we leave this place tonight, we pray that we would be energized, that we would be lifted up, that we would be encouraged by spending this time together in worship. And Father, we pray that you would help us to always remember that it's our job to shine that light to the world around us, to show the love of Christ in everything that we do. Father, help us to take advantage of every opportunity that you give us to spread that love, to spread the message, the good news, the gospel, that Christ died for everyone. Father, we pray that you will be patient, that you will continue to let us bring more souls to you. Father, we pray always for our safety, most of all spiritually, for we know that we should not fear those who can kill the body, but that one that can kill the soul. Father, we're so thankful for Christ, for the sacrifice that he made, for his willingness to come down to live that sinless life and yet to die on the cross with all of our sin on his shoulders. Father, we know that without that blood, we would have no hope of heaven. And we're so thankful for the plan of salvation that we are able to take advantage of. Father, help us to continue to choose to be more like Christ and less like the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Song for the lesson this evening will be Faith is the Victory, and we'll sing the first and third verses. He camped along the hills of life, Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle in the night, shall bear the glory skies. Against the foe it fails below, let all our strength be grown. Faith is the victory we know, that all Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the hope, why vain it shall be Thank you. 
Trust and obey, and we'll sing the first and fifth verses at the appropriate time. Matthew chapter 13. Please open your Bibles there. You have your Bibles with you? Some were looking around for theirs this morning. They have been placed in one of the classrooms or something, so hopefully you have yours. Matthew chapter 13. As we continue our study about the need of understanding the likeness of or the comparison of the kingdom of heaven, the parallel account in Mark 4 verse 30 is this, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? We often are given the task of trying to explain or to uh, describe something so that someone else maybe can understand it better. Or maybe, you know, what does that taste like? What does that look like? Maybe with our touch, what does it feel like? Use the illustration this morning of the blind men and the elephant of trying to decide, well, exactly what is this? Never before had touched one, they're blind, so they'd never seen it. And so as each one of them grasped a different part of the elephant, they said, well, it's like this. Whether it's the ears of being a fan or the tail of being a rope or just the side of it of being a huge wall, they were all trying to describe it or to give a likeness or comparison to what it was. And yet each one of them is only describing a small part of that animal to the neglect of the rest of it, so they did not have the whole picture. These parables or these likenesses, these ways in which Jesus uses to teach about the kingdom of heaven are things that are meant to give us greater depth as far as our understanding of them is concerned. Matthew chapter 13. We studied this morning very quickly as far as catching us up to what we are going to look at tonight. Number one, in chapter 13, he talked about the good seed beginning in verse 24. And we saw how that it was the struggle that is taking place between that which is necessary for us to have. The passage of verse 24 and following is distinct to Matthew. It is one of the distinctions also in that it is only one of the two parables that Jesus was asked, explain it to us better. We don't grasp what it is and so teach us. Number two, He talked about the mustard seed and what was to be found there, verse 31 and 32. And we see within it that it was the size that mattered, that it began very small, seemingly insignificant and not much there, but yet it grew into the greatest of the herbs and therefore was enough for the birds to come in and find rest within its branches. Then in verse 34, or rather 33, he speaks about the parable of the leaven and he says it is like that as far as the kingdom is concerned. In that within these three loaves of these measures, it passes through all of it, and so therefore it saturates or makes its way into all of it. And we emphasized our need of understanding the importance of influence. Tonight we'll look at the next three. There are seven in total, but our final one we'll use as a way of invitation as we see the importance of these likenesses And so the next one he has here is that we will study about as far as the treasure is concerned. Verse 44, Matthew 13, verse 44. He says again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in the field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. 
the importance of seeing what this is like is that this man sells everything that he has in order to purchase that plot of land. He finds this treasure, and no doubt it must be something that is greater, so much greater that he is willing to get rid of everything else that he possesses and sells it all. Now, there are times in financial difficulty that people may find it necessary to sell a lot of the things that they possess. To try and scrape up enough money maybe to pay the electric bill or to buy food for the table. But most of the time we're not required to get rid of everything that we have. But here was a man who on his own, he voluntarily chose, I'm going to get rid of everything because I know the value that's there in that field. How important is the kingdom of heaven to us? Realizing again that as it's described as the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about the future prospect of us living with God eternally. We'll see from, or we saw from one parable this morning, and we'll see from another one tonight, that the aspect of heaven and the judgment that takes place before it are still yet future. And so these parables and these teachings, these likenesses and comparisons, deal with everyday life and how we are to live it. Now, if we want something badly enough, we may scrape up, we may save every penny, we may do all that we can to finally get enough money to be able to purchase that or to do that. But that's not usually the case. This man couldn't run to the bank, so to speak, and borrow out or take out a loan. The Jews didn't like to charge each other interest and other things of that nature. But this man took his own possessions and in however matter, to whatever amount was necessary, he sold everything that he had. Now there is a similar statement to this as we find later on in the book of Matthew, that as this rich young man comes to Jesus, he comes with the question that's correct. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Wouldn't it be great that more of us and more of the people of our world would be so interested in spiritual things that they say, what is necessary for me to do? I want that eternal life. I want that time of eternity with God. Jesus said, you know the commandments. He said, I've kept thee from my youth up. I've kept these from my youth up. But Jesus knew his heart and said, there's one thing that's lacking. You may have kept these other things, but there's one thing that's standing in your way. Jesus said, you take everything that you have, you go and sell it, and you give to the poor. Now here was a man who came with the right question, but he didn't like the right answer. It says of this man that he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. I wonder if it had been any different if Jesus said, you take all of your possessions or you take half of them. Would he sold them then? Or maybe up to 90%. Maybe he could live off of the rest of the 10%. But whatever the case was, Jesus knew that something was holding this man back. And in rather enjoying eternity with God, he went away sorrowful. This teaching here about this treasure, what would we be willing to get rid of? In Proverbs 23, 23, it says, Buy the truth, B-U-Y, buy the truth and sell it not. It may not cost us financially to become a part of this kingdom. Most of us are probably great that we're not in the shoes of that man that Jesus said, sell everything that you've got. But in reality, 
Doesn't He require everything of us? Paul would write in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Paul, with this passage in Philippians chapter 3, says, I count all things for loss that I might obtain the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Here's a likeness about the kingdom of heaven. It says when we think about what may be important to the world, may be valuable to those outside of Christ, we need to count the cost and say, it's more than worth it. Whatever it's necessary for me to give up or to do without or to get rid of in order to have part in that kingdom presently and in the kingdom that will be delivered back to God, we should be willing to do. Next verse, 45. Matthew chapter 13, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. When, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and he bought it. A little bit different from the one before, even though both of them were willing to give up everything. The first one was he sold everything. This one... It's even beforehand in that he is seeking. We normally find what we're looking for. Whether it's things in life, things that, things that will make us happy, we normally find exactly what we're looking for. The statement in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 is this, Ask, shall find. Or ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. God wants us to be those people that are not just seeking, but are diligently seeking. Here is a man who it was his job. He was a merchant. He was a businessman. He was... That's his sole life. He bought and sold pearls. But he was always on the lookout for that one that was much better. The one that would stand out with greater size, greater luster. It was just better. Do we see the kingdom of heaven as that? That just as this man before sold so that he could find that treasure, or this man who was willing to give up everything because it was a pearl of great price. Now the price comes from the fact that Jesus gave His blood for the church. In Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for the remission of sins of many. A price tag is usually associated to something whether it's of little value or great value. When we understand the price that was pay, paid so that this might be put into effect, we need to see that its likeness can't be matched. Now, we may say that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And therefore, what this man saw in this pearl may not have been what someone else saw. They may have been looking for something different. They might have been looking for one that just matched something else. But there was nothing that would compare to this one. Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Those of the Gentiles were the ones who were concerned about everyday needs of life. God says He needs to be first. 
We need to seek the kingdom of God first. That means that we're seeking God first. Rather than trying to live and do things of our own wisdom and our own desire and what we may think is valuable or important. There were those that Peter would write to in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, when he says, Seeing you were de- redeemed not with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, which you have received from your vain conversation, but by the precious blood of the Lamb. How many of these cities have seen the rioting and looting? Yes, there are those that are rightfully protesting, but most of the images that we see now have to do with people who are just out to get something. They don't hold much value to property of others, whether it's police vehicles, store owners, and unfortunately, even the lives of others. They just don't see the value there. But yet here, this individual was willing because that's what he was looking for. He had in his mind already what was going to be that one pearl of great price. The kingdom of heaven is likened to this. Do we see it as being something to be sought after? Something to be diligently looking for? So that we might do those things that are necessary to attain, that is to become a part of it? So tonight, number one, there is that likeness to a treasure. Number two, there is their likeness to that pearl. And then the next one, verse 47. He says again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from the just and cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. As with the second one this morning, as we thought about the good seed and then the tares that were sown, The explanation of Jesus was quite similar to this in that they are both going to grow and that then comes the judgment or the day of harvest in which the wheat, the good grain, is going to be separated from the tares, the bad. But now, in a fashion that they would readily understand, you had Peter, Andrew, James, and John who were fishermen, And these people would understand the process of fishing with a net. Of how that it was used to cast out. You don't necessarily see what's underneath. You throw out the net and you gather everything together and then you separate what you would like to keep and throw away the rest. But he says the kingdom of heaven is like to this. In that there are within the world both good and bad. The Jews would understand that as they began to go through this, that there were certain fish that would be clean or unclean to them. They would be able to keep that which had scales or fins and get rid of the catfish. Some was good for them. Others were to be cast away. When we look at our world and we see the great difference between those who are part of the kingdom of heaven, the church of our Lord, and then those who are out in the world, we need to understand that as it describes some that are here, He will sever the wicked. Verse 48, he will cast the bad away. It doesn't take long for us to look at our world to know that there are bad things, bad people. 
and that there are wicked things and wicked people. There are people who could care less to know what God expects them to do. But you see, this life that is described here doesn't consider the consequences. It doesn't want to make notice of the fact one day we're going to have to give an account of what's happened, of how we've lived and the things that we've done. And yet that's the likeness that he's trying to draw here. That we need to understand we make a choice to be that which is going to be either good and therefore can be kept rather than that which is going to be thrown away and separated. Or this use in verse 50 of this phrase, the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. You may have seen the video of where the police officer has this individual down with his knee on his head, keeping him from breathing. Don't you imagine that he was pleading for his life? In this separation, we need to understand the consequence of hell is not because God wants us to be lost. He's not desirous of us to be separated from Him. He wants us to live with Him eternally. So we make the choice of whether or not we are going to be good or bad. This separation will one day come. In Revelation 21, verse 8, it says of some that they will be cast into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Death we understand physically as a time of separation. Our loved one has died. That person that we cared about is no longer with us. But here he's talking about that eternal separation where there is no opportunity, or at least we should hope not, to see that person that we loved in this life who was lost because of sin. We make the choice. We will all be gathered. We will all be separated. And that all depends on the things that we have done in this body. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. By way of invitation, the final time that Jesus makes this use is verse 52. But verse 51 is important as we think about it because He says, Have ye understood all these things? That is, in these descriptions and these likenesses and these comparisons, have you been able to grasp it? Or do you just see a small part of it like those blind men did with the elephant? God wants us to grow in our knowledge and come to a greater understanding of the truth. And so verse 52, based upon that question, therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. A seemingly odd way to end this discussion but the importance behind this is, is that a person, this scribe, uh, this recorder, or this writer of the law, this copier of important documents, would probably pick up on some of what is being said or written just by doing his work. But he wants us to be active in this, instructed these six likenesses before are all meant to instruct us about the likeness of these things to the kingdom of heaven and therefore our responsibility to become like them in the way that they are described. 
Therefore, if we are instructed, we as a householder, now this is an odd word because it really means this person who is a steward over a house, the one who is responsible for all the goods, both new and old within the house, an illustration was used in this passage that the uh, show Antiques Roadshow was out in the southwest somewhere, I believe Arizona, Tucson area. And they had someone bring in an old rug that they really didn't care about. Just on the last minute or a whim, they decided they'd carry it in just to see if they would say anything about it. Well, it didn't take long for them to find out that it wasn't just an old rug. It was an antique Navajo rug, of which they said only 50 of them were now in existence. The person who was giving the estimate of what it was worth said it's worth $350,000. They were going to get rid of it. They didn't like it. Before they left the show or the Antiques Road Show, they sold it for half a million dollars. They didn't think that it was worth anything. Came to find out differently. This individual who is over the care of this house, it's not up to him to decide what's good or bad, really what's valuable or not, it all belongs to the owner. We find in Hebrews chapter 3 that Moses as a servant was faithful in his house. But Jesus as a son was over his house. Moses, a servant, like this householder, he worked and served within it. Jesus is over it. Jesus sees everyone with a soul that is very, very valuable. Or else he would not have died for us. John would write in chapter 1, verse 29 of his gospel account, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. You're valuable. Because God wants you to be a part of His kingdom of heaven. He wants you to be a part of that kingdom that will one day be with Him eternally. But in order for us to do that, we have to be instructed. We have to be taught how to become that which God allows to be a part of His kingdom. The kingdom and the church are inseparably linked. The church of Christ is the kingdom of God presently. In order to become a part of that kingdom over which Christ is king, means that one would be added to the church. Acts 2 verse 47 they were praising God and having favor with the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. Don't you want to be saved? Well, to be saved means that you become a member of the church. To be saved means that you become a member of that kingdom. In order to be saved, you must have faith in God and His Word, Hebrews eleven six. That faith will motivate you and move you to turn from your sins in repentance, Acts 17.30. To make that confession that Jesus Christ is the King of kings because He is the Son of the living God, Matthew 16.16 16, and 1 Timothy 6.15. But it is in the act of one being baptized that they are translated, Colossians 1.13, from the power of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. If a person has not done that, they are still under the authority of Satan. They are still living for Him because they are obeying Him. Tonight, 
please consider the value of your soul and that God wants you to be saved. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, then please do so. But to each of us that are part of that kingdom already, we've already been added to the church. We must live a faithful, obedient life until our king returns or we lay our armor down in death. If tonight you're not serving God faithfully, then in repentance and confession of those sins, it would be our honor to pray for you tonight. Brother Jackson has selected a song, and we would encourage you that if we stand and sing, if you're subject to our Lord's invitation, please come as we stand and sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way, while we do our minds to the Lord's Supper, we're seeing years I spent in vanity, we're seeing the first and fourth verses. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring how my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me, he died on so that you can get to that bread.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight so thankful that we're able to gather around this table. Father, we're thankful to, for, that Christ implemented this remembrance, this communion, that we might have this time to focus on the sacrifice that he made. Father, we pray that as we partake of this bread, which represents his body, that we'll do so in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. continue with the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again. Thank you for this fruit of the vine as we partake of this that represents Christ's blood that was shed on the cross for us. Father, we pray that you will help us to not only remember that sacrifice, but to rejoice in the great victory that we have in knowing that Christ, after he died, was buried, was resurrected, and is now on the right hand of God. Father, we are so thankful for his sacrifice. We're thankful that he lives today. And Father, we are thankful that we have the hope of that eternal life in heaven with you due to that blood. Father, be with us as we partake of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. After this time, we'll have our closing prayer. We'll sing all three verses. When peace like a river
us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you at the close of this worship service, thanking you for the opportunity that we have had to come out and to sing songs of praise to you and hear another portion of your word. Pray that all things were done in accordance with your will. Pray that you will go with us now and bring us back the next appointed time. In Christ's name, amen.